Madame Marcos expressing her gratitude for the award. Your Imperial Highnesses, Prince and Princess Takamatsu, Sekajima, Madame Miki, Ministers of the Japanese government, Your Excellencies, members of the diplomatic corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Marcos's address in Japanese. I accept this prize on behalf of Marcos President Marcos and the people of the Philippines who are seeking for the realization of peace in the world. My friends, with humility and gratitude, I accept this honor on behalf of President Marcos and the Filipino people whose instrument I have been privileged to be in my people's search for the tranquility and peace of my country and the world at large so urgently needs. I wish that I did not have to accept this honor. I wish that the Kajima Peace Prize did not have to exist, for that would mean that peace in our world has at last been achieved. But the Kajima Peace Prize exists. It exists because man continues to be at war with himself. It is an ancient wisdom that man must change if they aim to enjoy the blessings of their universe, where there will be neither victors nor losers, victims nor predators, where only humanity prevails. But time and again, this wise advice has been ignored by governments, civilizations, and by man himself. Thus, empires have fallen by being deaf to the promptings of the human heart. The last empire is the empire of man. Will we not now listen to this ancient wisdom? Three decades ago, that empire had its intimations of mortality with the blaze of a million suns over Hiroshima. Perhaps it is timely for us to recall Paul Valery's warning that civilizations are mortal. The long shadow of that place remains with us a symbol of our fate. Let us consider this, reflect and contemplate. For there must be no more Hiroshima's, neither in fact nor in spirit. Let us all hope to love. Let us dare to be wise so that love and wisdom may finally be the way of man. Thank you. The audience is deeply moved by Madame Marcos's fervent address. This was followed by speeches of felicitations by guests. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished members of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you a representative of every journalist around the world who is forced to sacrifice so much to hold the line, to stay true to our values and mission, to bring you the truth and hold power to account. I remember the brutal dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta. My friend, Luz Meli Reyes in Venezuela, 
Roman Protasevich in Belarus, whose plane was literally hijacked so he could be arrested. Jimmy Lai languishing in a Hong Kong prison. Sunny Shui, who after getting out of more than seven years in jail, started another news group and now is forced to flee Myanmar. And in my own country, 23-year-old Frenchy May Kumpio, still in prison after nearly two years, and just 36 hours ago, the news that my former colleague, Jess Malabanan, was killed with a bullet to his head. There are so many to thank for keeping us safer and working. The Hold the Line Coalition of more than 80 global groups defending press freedom and the human rights groups that help us shine the light. There are costs for you as well. At least 63 lawyers, more lawyers have been killed than journalists in the Philippines. At least 63 compared to the 22 journalists murdered after President Rodrigo Duterte took office in 2016. Since then, Karapatan, a member of our Courage on Human Rights Coalition, has had 16 people killed, and Senator Lila de Lima, because she demanded accountability, is serving her fifth year in jail. Or ABS-CBN, our largest broadcaster, a newsroom that I once led, which last year lost its franchise to operate. I helped create a startup, Rappler, turning 10 years old in January. We're getting old. Our attempt to put together two sides of the same coin that shows everything wrong with our world today. The absence of law and democratic vision for the 21st century. That coin represents our information ecosystem, which determines everything else about our world. Journalists, that's one side, the old gatekeepers, the other is technology with its godlike power, the new gatekeepers. It has allowed the virus of lies to infect each of us, pitting us against each other, bringing out our fears, anger, hate, and setting the stage for the rise of authoritarians and dictators around the world. Our greatest need today is to transform that hate and violence the toxic sludge that's coursing through our information ecosystem prioritized by American internet companies that make more money by spreading that hate and triggering the worst in us. Okay, well, that just means we have to work harder. You know, in order to be the good, we have to believe there is good in the world. An old t-shirt from Rappler from 2014. I've been a journalist for more than 35 years. I've worked in conflict zones and war zones in Asia, reported on hundreds of disasters. And while I've seen so much bad, I've also documented so much good when people who have nothing offer you what they have. Part of how we at Rappler have survived the last five years of government attacks is because of the kindness of strangers. And the reason they help despite the, da the danger is because they want to with little expectation of anything in return. This is the best of who we are, the part of our humanity that makes miracles happen. This is what we lose in a world of fear and violence. You've heard that the last time a working journalist was given this award was in 1936, awarded in 1935. He was supposed to come and get it in 1936. Karl von Osiecki never made it to Oslo because he languished in a Nazi concentration camp. So we're here, hopefully a little bit ahead. We are both here. By giving this to journalists today, thank you, the Nobel Committee is signaling a similar historical moment, another existential point for democracy. Dimitri and I are lucky because we can speak to you now, yay, for court approvals. <laughs> but there are so many more journalists persecuted in the shadows 
with neither exposure nor support, and governments are doubling down with impunity. The accelerant is technology, when creative destruction takes new meaning. You've heard from David, we are standing on the rubble of the world that was, and we must have the foresight and courage to imagine what might happen if we don't act now, and instead, please, create the world as it should be, more compassionate, more equal, more sustainable. To do that, please ask yourself the same question we at Rappler had to confront five years ago. In less than two years, the Philippine government filed 10 arrest warrants against me. I've had to post bail 10 times just to do my job. Last year, I and a former colleague were convicted of cyber libel for a story we published eight years earlier at a time the law we allegedly violated didn't even exist. All told, the charges I face could send me to jail for about 100 years. But the more I was attacked for my journalism, the more resolute I became. I had firsthand evidence of abuse of power. What was meant to intimidate me and Rappler only strengthened us. At the core of journalism is a code of honor, and mine is layered on different worlds, from how I grew up, the golden rule, what's right and wrong, from college and the honor code I learned there, and my time as a reporter, and the code of standards and ethics I learned and helped write. Add to that the Filipino idea of utang na loob, literally, the debt from within. At, at its best, it's a system of paying it forward. Truth and ethical honor intersected like an arrow into this moment where hate, lies, and divisiveness thrive. When I first was arrested in 2019, the officer said, Ma'am, trabaho lang po. Ma'am, I'm only doing my job. Then he lowered his voice to almost a whisper as he read my Miranda rights. He was really uncomfortable, and I almost felt sorry for him, except he was arresting me because I'm a journalist. This officer was a tool of power an and an example of how a good man can turn evil and how great atrocities happen. 35 years after the People Power Revolt ousted Ferdinand Marcos and forced his family into exile, his son, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., is the front runner for president. And he has built an extensive disinformation network on social media, which Rappler exposed in 2019. It's literally changing history in front of our eyes. To show how disinformation is both a local and global problem, take the Chinese information operations taken down by Facebook in September 2020, a year ago. It was creating fake accounts using AI-generated photos for the US elections, polishing the image of the Marcoses in the Philippines, campaigning for the daughter of Duterte, of President Duterte, and attacking me and Rappler. Thank you for watching our videos. Please don't forget to click the subscribe button and the bell notification icon so you will be notified of our latest videos. And please do like and share all our videos. Maraming salamat po. And for more information, you can visit our website at bagonglipunan.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and TikTok at bagonglipunan72. And just a note, our Facebook page has been censored by the yellow fact checkers. That's why you can't see most of our posts on your news feeds. So for updates, directly visit our Facebook page, facebook.com slash bagonglipunan72. And please do like all our posts and share them. And please join our Marcos Loyalist organization at marcosloyalist.org. Let's make Philippines great again. Marcos Parin.